my name is Tony Sulkowski, and I'm here again with Ed Schwartz, a 35-year resident of Peters Township who has a rare degenerative condition, ataxia, which has no known cure. During, during our last session, Ed shared the 20-year journey he traveled to find out what was wrong with him. Today, he will describe to us the whole family of ataxia types that he has been able to discover and identify which of those he thinks he probably has. He will also describe the one ataxia impact that affects him the most. So, welcome to What Your Family Would Want to Know About Ataxia with Ed Swartz, and I'm Tony Slokowski, as I said before. Before we start today, Ed, do you have any, did you receive any questions from anyone after the first session that you think should be discussed immediately in this particular session? Not one, Tony. As a matter of fact, I think we either did so well or so <laughs> badly that we received no questions whatsoever. All right, then we're just going to jump right okay, into our planned fine. agenda for this show. That's fine. So why don't we start out with you telling us a little bit about the different types of ataxia. Okay. Uh, I thought before I started that I would give us a little bit of an introduction to set the scene, and that is this, that ataxia is a family for all seasons and all people. It shows no discrimination whatsoever. So no matter whether you're male or female or whether you're a child or adult, you're susceptible to ataxia. And I think that's important to know, particularly for families that have children. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanna, want families to be aware of that. That's good, so yeah. that they know from the get-go. Yes. So now, I can't contain myself any longer because you're sitting here with me and uh, we're kind of dressed differently today. Mm -hmm. And um, are you trying to portray a believable story here in a professional manner? Ta-da. But it uh, mm -hmm. doesn't seem like you're helping that cause at all. Well, I'm helping my own cause. And because of my age, I'm at a point where I'm more interested in safety than I am in beauty. Ah. And the, the, the beauty part's pretty obvious. But when I go outside and I'm working around the house and not setting it down someplace, I have to protect myself because I fall mm -hmm. an awful lot. I'm falling increasingly, and anybody who watched last week will know that that's the first sign. And so this is my gear that I wear outside. My hockey helmet, my knee pads, my arm pads, because I quite often if I fall, I stick this hand out to catch myself. Mm -hmm. And I also have a pair of hip pads like the football players wear, but I don't have those on today. That's all this is. I just wanted people to see this. Uh, if you see me around the house, it's not because I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. It's just because I'm trying to protect myself. You look like a rollerblader, so you'd be right in with the yes, kids I on the yes, trail here in uh -huh. Peters when they're yes. rollerblading. <laughs> not too much out of the no. ordinary. So you don't seem to be using a cane or a walker or a wheelchair, perhaps, like other people do. Is there a reason for that? Well, I do, and I use all of those at some given time. Uh, I use a cane probably more often than anything when I'm out of the house, but I've started walking using the wheelchair or the walker like you see here mm -hmm. uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I'm just more stable that way. And I also have already been equipped with an electric wheelchair. And if we're on a a situation where we're going to have to walk a long distance mm -hmm. or we're in a situation where there are a lot of crowds, I take that wheelchair. Because if I'm with a cane or if I'm with this walker, I'll get knocked down. Oh. People are not belligerent. They're mm -hmm. just, they're doing their own thing and they're in a hurry and they could not think about me at all. So again, it's a safety factor. It's a safety factor, uh-huh. Good yes, enough. Yes, it is. So now, I'd like you to share with us again, what are the different types of ataxia? Well, you know, there are, are quite a few types. And the more I study this, the more I find that. But I thought I'd start out with a couple that are relatively simple. The first one is known as acquired ataxia. Mm -hmm. And this is something that occurs to the person 
after they've had some other thing external happen to them. Mm. So they might have fallen and they might have gotten a hit on the head. They might have had a stroke. Uh, they might have had cancer or they might have had some kind of infection somehow. And out of that comes the ataxia. The ataxia being the uh, lack of coordination and the falling type of that thing. That kind of goes back to the first session when you talked about unrelated yeah. symptoms mm -hmm. of ataxia. So these can be a precursor, just these something out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be related to this at all, but it kind of sets it off. It, well, yeah, it sets it off and people will uh, recognize that when it occurs that because mm -hmm. these would typically occur not too long after the other event so there were maybe a, a direct link there to it you said that um, there are different classifications one of these which is this something out of the ordinary that happens where do you get your information for this well two or three places the first place i started was the national ataxia foundation and they have a wonderful library of technical papers that describe the different kinds of ataxia, what happens to people, what you need to do when. They have a whole bunch of these. I have since then uh, learned about PubMed, which is the website of the National Institutes of Health, which is very good. And also the, um, just the general web, mm -hmm. you go on there. You have to be careful sometimes because the it's true. Uh, the information you get is a little bit condensed. It's a little bit, uh, it's not as in-depth and not as good. Mm -hmm. um, one other place, uh, I was trying to think of it. I had it on the tip of my tongue. It'll come back and I'll, I'll mention it to you. Is there anything that um, maybe people in the medical community do at all? Do they publish? <sighs> independently or are you just not seeing very, that right very now? Very rarely, no. But I have found that through the Ataxia Society there are two or three or four people who are very, very good writers. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have written articles. A fellow by the name of Schwaman from uh, Boston General uh, is one. Uh, there's a lady with um, Stanford who has just written, written another book that uh, is written specifically for the medical community. You know, I've said that it's sometimes hard to find a, a doctor that knows anything mm -hmm. about this. There's a special five-dollar book written for the wow. medical profession. Is now, that the Dr. Perlman you have been Perlman, talking? Okay. yes, yes, Susan right. Perlman. And the book is available from the National Taxia Foundation for five dollars. Oh. And I got it, and that's one of the, the uh, documents that I used mm -hmm. quite extensively when I started putting this stuff together. I found that Allegheny General had a very, very good article on the web. Mm -hmm. And if you want to see people who have ataxia, go to YouTube. Because everybody and his brother is making a video for YouTube right now. And all you have to do is just search on ataxia. And of course, if you want to see mine, search on ataxia or It'll my be name. There, right? Yeah, and I don't know whether your name's on there as a right. co-spirator or not, <laughs> but it may be. But now, <laughs> my reputation will come back to haunt me. Yes, it will. So, you say that you're not an expert, but you certainly know more than people like myself. I mean, this is all new to me, and yeah. I just absorb so much from what you have been telling me. But uh, we want to know where should where should one start? You you talk about classifications can you and you talked about acquired so well, how about uh, uh, the other one okay the the next easy one that comes to mind quickly are the genetic or the hereditary types and these are caused by uh, a family member mm -hmm. who has a defective gene and they pass it on by heredity to the child and there are two kinds of those, and depending upon the nature of that type of gene, uh, a single parent can pass it on to the child. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, it's not uncommon for a family to have maybe multiple children 
with ge with uh, ataxia. Oh my! And only the one parent have the gene. The other type they call it a recessive type, and it takes each parent to have one copy of the gene mm -hmm. before it can be passed on. Now, I, I've raised the issue of the children because I want anybody that has ever seen any hereditary issues in their family to be aware that they might also have that issue and they might pass it on to their children or they may choose not to have children as mm -hmm. the case may be. And one of the things that you and I had talked about before and is one of the other types of uh, ataxias that's on our agenda today, I'll just talk about it here. It's the type that I have, which is called sporadic, S-P-O-R-A-D-I-C. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind that nobody knows what caused it. So it's not acquired. It's not acquired. Not genetic. Necessary. And it's not genetic. Mm. However, my wife Linda and I went to the National Ataxia Foundation Annual Conference in Florida three weeks ago. And we sat in several sessions with the Schwamans and the Perlmans of the world. And they all indicated that as they find more and more and more about this, that they think that if somebody like me has had a taxi for a long time and has not been able to figure it out, it's probably a defective gene and they have not found the gene yet. Okay, so they haven't typed They these. haven't typed, there okay. is, and see, they're finding them all the time. It seems to me that when I first started reading on a taxi, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago, maybe that far back, that they had only found about 20 genes. Today, they've identified more than 40 genes mm -hmm. that are defective that'll cause a taxi. Now, one or two of them are duplicates, so that gene 27 is the same as gene 13, but not many. And when you find those genes, they are numbered sequentially mm -hmm. in the order in which they were discovered. So that, do that doesn't mean that gene 13 and 14 are twins or are the uh. same family. It just means that some researcher found 13 mm -hmm. and the next researcher found 14. Well, you're not only learning a lot about ataxia, but you're learning a lot about other things in research that it impacts not only your condition, but other medical oh, conditions as a little well. Bit. Yes, yes. Just through reading, attending conferences, etc. So, uh, when you are looking at all of this information and you think about yourself, what are some examples that you can think about um, in your own particular case when you're looking at uh, what caused your ataxia? Well, you know. We never thought in terms of causal mm -hmm. until just we start, since we started putting this program together. And I've increased my reading quite a bit in the last three weeks. But we can think of two specific cases. The first happened when I was maybe eight or 10 years old. I was playing sandlot football in the backyard. And I tackled a fella. None of us were wearing equipment. I tackled a fella. I hit my head into his side. I knocked his kidney loose, and I was out cold just instantaneously. And then when I came back, and I knew my head and my neck had been all jammed because I, I went like this. I juked my neck for quite a long time, mm -hmm. and I went and had orthopedic manipulation for a while. To the extent that I've got a problem with the cerebellum, which is right back here, thought, hmm, light bulb went off. So that may be one. That may be one. So now you think there may be another one. Yes. But before you proceed to that, we're going to take a brief commercial break. Okay. And we'll let the audience take a look at the commercial, and then they could be thinking about maybe what the second thing was that uh, caused perhaps your condition of ataxia. Okay. So uh, we'll let you all watch the commercial, and we'll be back after this announcement.
Together, we can change the news. Find out how at safekids.org. Well, welcome back. We are ready now to hear what Ed has to say about his uh, presumed second reason that may have caused or led to the development of his condition of ataxia. He had already told us about his sandlot experience playing football and getting hit in the cerebellum area. So now, Ed, what is this second experience that you, as you think back in time, what maybe could have been a cause? Okay, this happened in an adult lifetime. My daughter moved into a rental property in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it needed some wiring done. And we knew that the uh, rental agent wasn't going to do anything about it. So dear old dad crawled in the attic in a hot summer afternoon and spent a couple hours in an unventilated attic oh pulling electrical wire. And when I came down out of that attic, I was loopy. And I don't remember much other than coming down mm -hmm. and sitting on the floor. And my wife says that I was uh, out of it for a while. I was just rambling and of no value whatsoever. Classic case of hypothermia, I guess. Is that too much heat? And, oh, hypothermia? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And as we were reading through stuff, we saw that as a possible cause. Hmm. So that may have been it as well. You know, you never, you never know. And we, in the last couple of weeks, we thought of another case where very early on, we had an indication. We were playing tennis. I was playing at the right net and there was a wide shot off of my right side. I ran forward and to the right to get it. I dropped down like this, boom. I just went absolutely flat on my face hmm. on the tennis court. That's the way I go down right now. Mm -hmm. If I fall, I go fast and hard. Wow. And that may have been the first time that we had an indication of that as the daytime down. It. Now that wasn't the cause. Right. But it was that, a, like symptomatic. It was symptomatic, huh. yes. And that's one of the natures of this condition is you start looking for the symptoms of a variety of other conditions which individually aren't the cause, but collectively they're indicative, perhaps, of a taxi. So as a result now, as you progress through this condition, I want to go back to what you're dressed up as today in your, all your protective gear and everything. So you- I'm not dressed up, <laughs> I'm me. You're looking good. Yeah. And you wear green well. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have the helmet and the pads and everything. You mentioned um, in your chest area some padding. Could you show sure. the audience that a little bit so we could see as an example what you have under here? This particular padding, of which I have one like a football player might wear, is designed to help my balance. It was, it's manufactured by a company in California. They do an analysis of your tendency to fall. And in my case, I either typically go over backwards mm -hmm. or I go off this direction. And pretty predictive in those two directions. And this vest is designed to counteract that. Inside the vest, Velcro lining, steel weights with a Velcro outer weight. Ooh, they are a little and heavier than yeah. what you expect. Yeah, when they first put this on me, they did a computer generated profile of my tendency to fall. Mm -hmm. And you find out that, that there's a locus of points as long as I stay within these, and I'll call them tipping point mm -hmm. after the book that's popular. Oh, yeah. Very as good book too. As long as I too. stay in within my tipping point, I can balance pretty well. But once I exceed that, boom, I'm down. These are designed to help me stay within the tipping point. Mm -hmm. So on the first shot around, they had a bunch of the weights back here, had a bunch in here. 
They had close to 10 pounds of these things in this. Oh, my. And I wore them around for a year, and I went on my first diet for a year, and I lost 10 pounds. I'll bet. And I think it went right there. Uh, I had a second fitting of the vest by a different technician. This technician was much more experienced, did not use a computer-generated thing. She just said, walk. She'd watch me. And then she'd fiddle around with the weights. And then she'd say, walk again. You're walking a little better. How's that feel? And at the end of that, I'm now wearing two and a half pounds okay. of weights inside this vest. Mm -hmm. And they are right here. Equally spaced on either side of my throat to help me go this way. And I have lifts inside my shoes just to raise my heels a very little bit. So you and wanted to show us a little bit of like what it's like for you to stand up? Well... We don't want you to fall. No, I just... When I stand, I've gotten so, and this, this is exciting for me, that after two years of therapy, I'm practicing standing like this. Mm -hmm. I can stand with my feet together, with my eyes open for a minute, and I stand with my feet spread about this far with my eyes closed well, that's for good. a minute. That's good. Now, if I went to walk to that camera, mm -hmm. I would be all over the place, see? But as long as I'm stationary, I can do pretty good. Okay, you're making me a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> you're afraid I'll sit on you. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. Thank you for demonstrating that. Now, I noticed, too, what's this little gray thing with the tag here? Do you think you can turn yeah. that around? and? This is for my protection right after I fall. Okay. And I hurt myself. See the little button? I push that button, and it calls a call center someplace where an operator will come on and talk to me. And I can talk right there. And they will say, are you okay? And I'll say, yes or no. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, okay, Mr. Schwartz, what's it? They call me by name because they know who I am because it's coded when I call in. If I don't respond, they will call my wife or one of my kids and say, dad's down. Do you know what the problem is? And if they say, yeah, okay, that's as far as they go. If they don't respond, they automatically call the ambulance and send it to me. Now, the ambulance knows where I am because it's a GPS as well. That's awesome. Yeah, it's kind of neat. The only problem it has is that it's a new device out. This is a second generation. And this button is just a little bit above the surface. Mm -hmm. And I have a tendency to close, oh. wrap my arms like this. So if I ever want to have warm comfort, I just go like this, and somebody would call and say, are you okay, Mr. Schwartz? I said, yep, I just wanted to rub, close my arms mm -hmm. and see if he'd call me. They do, all the time. They had to call me this morning once because I was sitting at the computer working on our presentation mm -hmm. for today, and I forgot. But it's kind of neat. But, so you know it works. Yeah, I know it works. A good it, also, thing. it has a device in it that if I fall, mm -hmm. and I fall too hard, or too far, it will also call automatically on its own. Now, if I were just to drop it from this height to this table, it wouldn't go. If I drop it this height, it'd call. Now, I don't think we want to do that now. So it has a motion sensor in it. Yeah, yeah I think that they call it is really neat. Yeah, it's a sudden stop. It's like the fall out of the airplane. The fall doesn't hurt you, but that sudden stop does. Jeez. I'm going to jump to one more topic here okay. um, in the few remaining minutes we have. And in session one, you basically mentioned a little bit about gluten and its relationship to ataxia. Is that a possible cause? Well, I don't really know. The only thing I can offer you is this, that 20%, in excess of 20%, of the people like me who have sporadic ataxia, mm -hmm. have a sensitivity to gluten. Hmm. And you find this out by running food tests, food allergy tests. Right. And I do. I have a sensitivity to gluten. If you recall, we said the first 
time that I talked to that physician in Cincinnati without ever seeing me. He says, I know what's wrong with you, Ed. So I went on that diet, and that went away. Now, the other piece of information that is available, uh, there are two books, one written by Davis, one written by, uh, I can't think of his is name. Is it right. uh, Perlmutter? Perlmutter, yeah, Perlmutter. Perlmutter, yeah. And both of these fellows have reached the same conclusion that as a result of the genetic changes we've made to corn in the interest of increasing field yield without really doing any testing to see what it impact has on the human mm. body, that mm. we've made a significant uh, increase in the obesity in this country and also sugar diabetes. And I will have that uh, reference for us on our next uh, talk. Okay. And I have the graphs in that talk. So if people want to come back, I can show them the graph and when we get to that, it has that in it. Well, so we'll get a little more specific in our third session. Yeah. But this session was very informative. I love the show and tell. <laughs> and I thank you so much for sharing uh, with us your wardrobe and what you wear and how you protect yourself yeah. and keep yourself safe. Got to. As well as some of the um, suggested reasons why people get ataxia. You talked about that and shared a little bit of that with us as well. And so um, I guess we have some additional fundraisers that are going to be coming up with ataxia as well this year and they're going to be announced very soon. The last fundraiser held at Trinity United Methodist was very success successful. Cross Vision, the Hobbs sisters and Reverend Mark Stewart did a wonderful job. There were a lot of people in attendance who were very supportive and so we'll be excited to learn a little bit more about the upcoming fundraisers. This is Tony Sulkowski wishing you a well warm Goodbye until our next time when Ed Schwartz and I are going to discuss other ataxia issues, especially those that impact Ed and his wife Linda, as well as what you should consider doing if you think you may have ataxia. So thank you for viewing this session of what every family needs to know about ataxia with Ed Schwartz. <laughs>